Something I can't help but think about is how my birth mother was treated after she gave birth to me and how I was treated after I was born. A whole mechanism went into place to help me find a family. She walked out of the hospital hours after she gave birth to me, slept on the streets that night. Nobody cared. There are so many women and families who need support that we're choosing not to see. I think it's really strange the fact that the federal government is willing to throw billions of billions of dollars to random strangers to take care of kids, but like not the kid's family that is obviously in dire need for that help. Um, is the new social worker here? Yeah. Well, I'm Jackie. Hi, so good to meet you. Nice Come on in. Noelle is right. Yeah. The government spends a lot on support like social workers and nurses visiting us in our own home. And it may not feel like support when they ring the doorbell at 7 a.m. on a Saturday, but it's been a number of months now and we still have people checking up on Jay every single week. How different would this country be if every family had access to that kind of support? He's meeting all of his milestones. He's wow. very social. Yeah. I want to see what's hey. new with this guy. Oh, yeah. here we go. Oh, okay. is that better? Okay. About how often does he poop normally? Um, once a day. Okay. But it's hard. It's hard and pellety, but about I'd what say percentage? Okay. I'd say like 80%. Mm -hmm. Poor guy. The width of like mm -hmm. a sausage. Poopgenic foods. Hard poop. poop. Pooping and harder poops. Mm -hmm. We had other questions, didn't we? Welcome back to The F Word, a series about adopting a kid from foster care. Throughout this process, we've thought a lot about parents who've lost custody of their children to the system, but we've never actually had the opportunity to meet any of those parents or get to know their stories. It kind of feels like we're all in the same subway car together, but it's taboo to start a conversation. So we decided to sit down with parents who have reunified with their children. I actually have four kids. Three um, are stepkids, but I hate that word. They're my kids. They're everything to me. So I have an 18-year-old and a 13-year-old and then an 8-year-old. And the 8-year-old, she has these three stuffed animals that she takes absolutely everywhere with her. And I do have to babysit them sometimes. Does she pay you? No, <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> I have four girls, and they're girly girls, and, and so... Sometimes I got to put my pride aside and, um, you know, they want to go get their nails done. Well, let's go. And I'll kick off my socks and shoes there and I'll, yeah, I'll get, give me the works. You put the man in manicure. I'm a single mom of four. The first time I was in contact with CPS, I was in the San Jose Supportive Family Shelter. It was just me and three kids that were homeless out in San Jose. I was fleeing a, a very violent situation. The last time I saw my husband, he had put me in the hospital. I was reaching out to every organization that I could find for help. But unless you had a criminal background or unless you were an addict, there was nothing that you could get, nothing. Throughout the whole year, I was homeless with them. Um, I got back into drugs. Eventually, I was arrested. And then I found out while I was in jail that CPS came and took them. home, I had to have them removed. Like, I literally went into the CPS office, grabbed a sleeping bag, rolled it out on the floor and said, I am not leaving here. You can have me arrested until my kids are safe. Do you think if you'd gotten more support, more services, more people advocating for you earlier on, that things might have turned out differently? If I would have been able to have been helped before, my kids would have never been removed. Way too many kids are coming into foster care because of poverty. 
in situations where mom is really struggling to make ends meet and is living in substandard housing and has many jobs and there's not enough food in the fridge. So a social worker might walk into that situation and think, neglect. But often in those situations, what the kid actually needs is support that would address the underlying conditions of poverty. Historically, CPS has taken black kids from their homes at a higher rate than white families. If there's one thing that's become clear to us, it's that there's deep systemic racism and classism in the child welfare system. Black families are so disproportionately targeted by CPS that it's actually led people to call foster care the new Jane Crow. But it's not at all clear cut. While we hate being part of such an unjust system, we know there's still a very real need for foster parents. I think the best analogy is that foster care is like chemo. It's inherently toxic. It's inherently traumatizing to separate a child from their family and put them in a stranger's home. But there are some kids who need chemo, but you better be sure that kid has cancer before you give them that inherently toxic treatment. A lot of the cases that I see and a lot of cases that I know about do exhaust um, the reunification process and trying to reunify with the biological family. My process definitely honored that. From birth, I was continuously reunified and it just didn't, didn't work out. Um, and so they gave my biological mom a lot of chances and my birth family a lot of chances. And then I got adopted at five years old. The only downside about that is when you give kids temporary homes, that's temporary care and temporary love, and that's not what we want to do for kids. The child is going through like an emotional homelessness. We are really very much in favor of the goal of reunification when reunification is possible for families. And we know that foster care is meant to be temporary, but we walked into it, you know, with the hope of creating a permanent family and adopting. Um, and so, how do you reconcile these things? Knowing that our family was created as a result of, of a system where there are so many resources for foster care families, it's a challenge because you want to advocate for those birth parents who are left, you know, with their, with their families kind of torn apart. On the flip side, there are times when things don't work in those cases. Let's recognize that there's a, an alternative way. <laughs> we have been Jay's foster parents for three months. In three weeks, the court will have the 2-6 hearing where the judge will decide whether or not to terminate parental rights. Typically, if rights are terminated, the child's social worker will seek to make the foster family a permanent adoptive home. In this case, that's us. The hardest part of all of this is being able to hold two things at once, loving Jay and being able to let him go if that's what the courts decide. And all of this is out of our control. We have to tell ourselves that if reunification is part of his plan, He'll carry the love we gave him when he leaves. So we continue to love him day in and day out, and we do our best to be present in the moment and not look too far into the future. You're crying. <laughs> we wanted to take a moment to tell you about Foster America. It's a nonprofit organization with a mission to improve the lives of children in foster care or children who are at risk of entering foster care. But the way they do this is really unique. They recruit talented professionals with skills and expertise that are critically needed, but in short supply in the child welfare sector. To learn more about this movement, go to foster-america.org. And to learn about becoming a foster parent, volunteering, or other ways to support foster youth, go to fostermore.org.